Okay, in this video, I'm gonna be pulling together a few different parts that I have available and building a streaming slash Chia mining machine that's gonna be located in my shed and hopefully always be set up so my nine-year-old daughter can just come in here whenever she wants to record some footage and do some Pokemon card unboxings or potentially do a little bit of video editing out here or play around with some games that she's creating in Unity, drawing some assets on her iPad, whatever she'd like to do. It's just another asset that I'm hoping to have at her disposal that can keep inspiring her to you know, play around with tech um, she's only nine and at that age I, I love to tech so I'm trying to encourage her in that way as much as possible. Um, here in front of me I have an MSI Carbon Z590 gaming Wi-Fi motherboard. This is a 10th slash 11th generation motherboard. What I also have with me today is just two sticks of 16 gigabytes Corsair Vengeance. I also have a CPU that I've pulled out of a broken machine. Uh, be careful there. This is just a 10700F. And I've also got a RTX 3080 that I'm going to be pulling out of a mining machine and chucking in this rig. And because this is a Chia, sort of Chia mining computer, uh, which is essentially a blockchain protocol that was created by the founder of BitTorrent from memory. This is Bram Cohen. Um, they created a mining protocol whereby you verify the network transactions based on how much space you have dedicated to the network. So I'm going to be bolting on multiple SATA drives and hoping that I have some stability. I'm sorry, PCIe cards, which provide eight SATA outputs. So I'm hoping to connect between 20 and 30 hard drives to this machine. And if it's stable, then we're all good to go. Um, this is definitely not something I'm a specialist at in regards to Chia mining hardware. Um, but I've got some spare hard drives that I'm gonna be throwing into this and see how we go. Uh, and I'm just gonna get this build underway. So this is our, typically when you buy a motherboard, it has a CPU cover protector because for the Intel series anyway, um, you have tiny little metal pins in your CPU socket, which you do not want to break. Um, those little golden pins, there's, I actually don't know the count of them. Um, I know the socket numbers, usually, you know, 1155, 1156. I presume that they're referencing the pin counts. Um, sounds a bit, yeah, I'm surprised I've never actually looked into that and it does actually look like there's over a thousand pins there. So you definitely don't want to, to break any of those. And the way the CPUs are set up for Intel sockets is that essentially you have a flat plane with all of your copper connectors on the underside of the CPU. Um, on the contrary, whilst this is almost like, I can't necessarily say the female side, but the male is definitely on the CPU socket with all the pins sticking up. Uh, on the contrary, when you have an AMD CPU, AMD have the male pins coming out of the CPU going into the female on the motherboard. So they've been, uh, for, they've been like that for as long as I remember. Um, anyone correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I'm pretty sure even back in the you know, AMD XP Athlon era from you know 1990, uh, when I was a kid, 1998 or so. Even back then, I'm pretty sure we, we've always had this well, structural design whereby AMD have decided to um, place, have metal pins and Intel on the contrary. So, the way I know how to, which direction to install the CPU is there is two little notches that are cut out on either side of the CPU. And I just make sure that I can see those same notches in the motherboard, which gives me the indication as to the direction that the CPU needs to be installed. There is only two notch cutouts for this particular CPU. And it can change from generation to generation. So this is an, a 10th gen 10,700F CPU that I'm installing. F indicating that this CPU does not have an onboard graphic card or an integrated graphics unit inside the CPU, which means I need to have a dedicated graphics card. So this particular clamp mechanism here, this is intended to clamp down your CPU to make sure it doesn't move and it stays firmly compressed against those pins. Typically, you need to pull back this pin here to have the metal enclosure move back behind this screw. As you move it forward, it gets locked behind this little nut here. We can pull down and then we actually need to pull to the side ever so slightly. So upwards in this instance and just lever it under that pin there. And similarly, when, when the motherboard comes out to you, there's actually that pl plastic cover in there and the process is to push down, push out, lift, pull back, and then you can release that metal cover getting ready to install your CPU. In this instance, I am being a little bit lazy. I should have cleaned this CPU, but this machine is not gonna be under a heavy load. Um, if anything, I'm probably just gonna grab a dab of thermal paste and hope for the best. Once again, this PC is not gonna be under tremendous load by any means, so I can't see there being a significant issue. Um, this CPU has come out of a broken Dell machine. 
um, which is very interesting. Those machines are, well, this is the Dell XPS 8940s. Um, they don't have proper coverage based on the heat spreader that was installed. You can see there's little bits of metal all around the side that show that the CPU didn't have full contact with the, the heat spreader, uh, sorry, with the CPU fan that was placed on top. It's placing a little dab, probably a little bit too much, but we should be okay. And um, now I actually haven't prepared this next part. This is going to be interesting. I'm not installing the simplest of fans. Uh, I have a spare Corsair, I'm not Corsair, not Corsair, Cooler Master 522, I think, Hyper. And this particular CPU is, it's not as, sorry, this particular CPU fan is not as easy as your standard. Um, your normal CPU fans that you can just drop right on top. In fact, I'm almost tempted for this video just to install a normal one. Um, your, your typical stock CPU fan looks just like this. And you have these little knobs that you rotate. So you rotate them anti-clockwise when you would like to release the pin. There's a little locking pin at the bottom here that goes and injects into the motherboard. So you, you rotate it anti-clockwise, pull up, and then you rotate it clockwise to get it ready to inject into the motherboard. So once it's clockwise, 90 degrees, it's ready to go. And we simply push down into the motherboard and depress that pin and that will actually inject a black piece of plastic down the end, separating these two pins, locking them behind the motherboard. Once again, I'm tempted for simplicity in this video to install, but having said that, if I don't install this fan now, I'm never going to install it. Um, this fan is slightly more complicated to install. Reason being, I need to actually install a catch behind the motherboard that we're going to be screwing into. And unfortunately, I've just put some, some thermal paste on. So be very mindful of how this is all going to play out. So it looks to me like I've got some cat hair. <laughs> Uh, now let's see, I also have some screws. Let's just take a look. I haven't installed this particular, this is a spare available fan, so I might be missing some screws for it. Let's just do a quick stock check on what screws I've managed to find. So these are supposed to be placed behind the motherboard. And let's just have a quick look sees. So those screws aren't even long enough to fit through. And I don't believe this is intended. I can't just simply place that there. I don't believe I've got the right screws for the job. So I might skip on that fancy fan until I can find it one day in the future. And if need be, we can just spin up this standard stock fan. Doing one quick sanity check, making sure I definitely don't have the necessary screws. One moment. No, nope, that ship has sailed. And too many other things to get ready. Let's get a move on. Okay, so we're going to place the standard Intel stock fan. Once again, I'm going to rotate them all anti-clockwise, lift up just to pull back that black pin from the end depressing the unit, rotating it clockwise, getting it ready for injection, anti-clockwise, lift, clockwise, ready for injection, anti-clockwise, lift, clockwise, ready for injection. Now we can simply replace the fan, uh, place the fan in, I'd say no particular way other than you'd like to have your cable, somewhat cable managed. So you gotta identify where is your CPU fan header. So this over here, I've got a CPU fan header Fan header meeting, where am I actually installing the CPU fan? In this instance, it's indicated by text that states CPU fan. I'm going to place that back down. So for me, I don't quite have enough length on that side. Probably a bit too much length on that side. I don't mind too much about the logo and the direction of the logo. So I'm just going to take... Yep, I'm just going to install it in this fashion and then wrap the cable around the CPU because the CPU, um, there's cable management. I say once you've lined up, sorry, the, the pins in the holes, at this point in time, you can simply, and I can do this on the underside, show that the 
little plastic nibs are starting to appear through. And if I push, push with my finger, am I going to get this right? Push my thumb through. Let's just put a bit of pressure there. You can actually see that it's starting to appear more here. Let's try to see in the camera. Have we got this right? Let's pull the nibs out. See if I can get it to go through this time. Interesting. Actually having a little bit of trouble with this CPU band. Let's quickly remove this for one moment. Sometimes you can have your pins broken from prior installs. And these are depressed sufficiently, so I'm a little bit surprised I was having so much resistance just trying to push that through. It shouldn't typically be overly difficult. Normally it's quite simple to just put a bit of pressure and no, I am suspicious that this is broken. It's just, I don't want to put too much pressure on the motherboard. This is crazy. Okay. What I'm going to do in this instance is not use that CPU fan. Fortunately, I've got a spare one. I'm using secondhand components. So sometimes you come into a couple of issues along the way. Let's just grab a different one. All right, let's try again. So let's just quickly get this ready to go. All these nibs look fine. Clockwise, clockwise, clockwise. It's a little bit of a dirty fan. I'll have to give this a brush up afterwards. So placing them over the holes, going through the same story as before. I'm going to be surprised if this doesn't fit through. So as expected, just a little bit of pressure and it comes through. I am such an amateur or something. I'm not. And I've built so many computers and I am being absolutely flabbergasted by how difficult I am finding some of these pins to go through. So that's the sort of click sound that it makes and you can see that that black pin has now been ejected through the rear of the motherboard and that's essentially the locking mechanism. And if I do it for this one here in the corner, give some visibility, let's see if I can actually get that on camera. Come on autofocus, work for me. Stay still and push. So that one's clicked in. I'm having a little bit of a problem with this one down here. And I don't know if it's actually the mechanism now. That's, that's kind of interesting because there is this. Let me just fiddle with this a bit. I might not get this on camera per se, but anti-clockwise release. It is released. Clockwise, which should actually be placing it into get ready to eject, inject mode. Um, let's see if I can push it through. Yep. All good. All good. All good. Makes a very satisfying click once it's injected correctly. Let's place that CPU fan connector onto the CPU fan header. CPU fan headers are associated with, and you want to plug it into the right fan header because the CPU fan header is connected with the CPU temperature statistics that are, in, that are captured by the motherboard deep underneath the CPU fan alongside the CPU die or I'm trying to think at which. I've never actually visually inspected where the, the sensors are currently stored, but there's usually quite a few CPU sensors which are probably actually within the CPU themselves, um, communicating via the motherboard API to you know, turn, return those statistics to the BIOS and to the PC itself. So interestingly enough, this CPU fan header is connected to the temperature statistics. So if your temperature is increasing, then the fan speed will automatically elevate. And you can also tune fan performance profiles. You can set your fans to be 100% all the time, or you can have more aggressive profiles that if they detect a little bit of temperature increase, then you know blast the fans, or you can have it on like a silent profile where it says, look, I'm happy to sacrifice a bit of temperature and performance and have my CPU get to 60, 70 degrees, and, but only keep the fans running at 30 degrees, and uh, sorry, 30%. And then as it goes up another 10 degrees, go to 40%. So you can you know, tune your performance profiles. But essentially you want that to be connected to the CPU header because that's where you have that control. If you connect it to say a standard CPU, ca uh, sorry, case fan header, then you're not going to have those curves associated with your CPU temperature. So I'm going to be installing the RAM now. Um, typically from memory, we will, oh, there's actually, I'm not even going to talk on this topic within this video. Um, I'm just going to go with slots one and three, but depending on your motherboard type, and I believe by inspecting the traces, um, I'm not going to know how to do that. So that's beyond me, but there is actually a preference, a recommendation as to which slots your RAM should go into for optimal performance. But for the intended purpose of this video and intended purpose of this machine, it's most likely going to be inconsequential as to the performance impact for RAM. Um, I also have some spare... NVMe drives that I'm going to be installing today. So these are going to be my main operating drives as well as 
um, secondary drive for storing our streaming and video editing files. Uh, this particular motherboard has these heat sinks here that cover the NVMe drives. They do get particularly hot. Um, so this motherboard provider or this particular model is more premium, but it has a heat sink. Uh, your standard NVMe drives, I've seen them get to, you know, over 80 degrees. Um, they're just little chips sitting on your motherboard, so. And they're probably quite a recent rendition. You know, NVMe drives have only started to become more and more popular over the last four years. Um, so people are starting to innovate in how they do the cooling solutions around them. This particular motherboard has a protective coating. That coating should definitely be removed. It's going to be applied to your heatsink. Now, my primary, I'm going to be setting as a one terabyte gigabyte drive. I'm not going to go into too many of the specs on these. I believe they're either Gen 3 or Gen 4. They're going to be you know, allowing transfer speeds of you know over three gigabytes a second, which is insane. Um, this should not be an incredible amount of force. It is placing the NVMe drive inside the NVMe slot and just giving it a little bit of a push. And you should actually see, I'll just pull back, the metal pins just disappear. There's no large obvious click. It's a little, it's a very minute shift in, but what you will notice is that your screw connector at the end, this semi-circle, is above the screw point on the motherboard to allow you to screw it down. Now, what I'm gonna do is actually remove this just for a moment because the screw for this particular motherboard has been set further back. Um, I'm not entirely sure why I've got, I've never actually seen this screw so far away. Uh, I don't know, that means we've got some NVMEs that are ridiculously long, but you can, you know, move this little mounting bracket. Um, let me just move the camera. I was using this, a, oh, courier has arrived. I'm just gonna pause. Okay, just resuming it. Just have to have some computers shipped out. So installing this drive there, typically your motherboard comes with multiple screw slots for, yes, you can see that, uh, multiple screw provisions for your NVMe drive mounts. I'm not familiar with the longest or the furthest away mount. I haven't seen an NVMe drive that's so large. Um, just reinstalling that now though to this particular position, which is the same length as my NVMe drive. It's gonna apparently be a little bit shaky. Uh, place my NVMe drive in, give it that little click. Well, that gave me a satisfying click that time around. Uh, then I need to locate a screw. Typically, your motherboard provides you the same. Uh, let me just double check. Yep. Oh, okay. I've just made a whoopsie. So that particular mount down there is actually for the heat spreader. So the heat spreader or the heat sink, whatever you like to call it is actually screwing into that provision. So I actually just need to remove some screws that came with the motherboard and get them prepared. So I'll just install that again. Looks like I might actually be short because this motherboard didn't provide me heaps of screws. Let's see what we have here. Oh no, I've got some more. Let's see what we can achieve. Now, I don't know where I've picked these up, but they're just tiny little screwdrivers that have come with different IT components. And I usually find that they can help. Or you can have a fancy iFixit kit. Uh, they're usually about 50 odd US dollars. Um, they'll have many different screwdrivers and tools to like, take apart phones, PCs, electrical components. And I'm not even using my iFixit kit. It's, it's a little bit intimidating for this video, I think, but don't want people to feel like you need anything and every tool under the sun to build a PC. Whereas in reality, most of the time, since forever, you've just been able to get away with a small, you know, the standard Phillips tip, but you know, I think, I don't know what this rating is, if it's like T1, I forget. I've never done full screwdriver analysis, but just a pretty standard Phillips head. Uh, for, forever more has you know, gotten you by with PC installs. Um, in this instance, you need a smaller screwdriver typically for your NVMe drives as well nowadays. Now let's just place that on top and find, I've got the screw provision there. I didn't pay attention to the greatest degree, but yes, I found the right screw. Cool. 
I'm just going to screw that down. Don't have a good angle on that, sorry. I've got one screw over here. So there is that thermal pad that's on the underside of this metal heat sink here. So that thermal pad is going to transfer heat to this large heat sink. That will heat up and then that will be cooled down by passive airflow within the case. I don't know if passive airflow is the right word. I've... Let's get some screws ready. Okay, now do I want to install my secondary? I'm going to have to. I've got a two terabyte, so I've got a one terabyte NVMe gigabyte drive that I just installed, and now I'm going to install a two terabyte Seagate Fire Cuda. The only thing is, I do have quite a few screws here that need to be removed from this large heat sink that's just covering this large portion of the motherboard. Interesting to see what's under here. You know, I dare say I'm not working on the best platform. I'm working on a wooden bench. Um, it's a bit rickety. I wonder what the, what the guys over at you know, Lions Tech Tips work on. Some sort of anti-static plastic rubberized bench. Food for thought, never thought about it. But I'm sure I'm... I mean, me personally, I'd probably be working on top of like an anti-static bag and with a piece of foam on the inside typically, but... That's if I was working with new products and you know, I'm a lot more casual right now with just pulling together a bunch of secondhand gear. And for the last 20 years, I've honestly never had anything break. Oh, okay, so I've just removed heaps. Oh, there's like another heat spreader there. That's probably for different, like the motherboard chipset sockets. Um, so that would be independent. This is just gonna be cooling down both the NVMe drive plus motherboard. I'm tempted to almost just do, you know, Cool. Use the independent just so I'm not sharing a heatsink, even though it is quite large. Um, I don't have to share a, a heatsink with the motherboard. So, if my NVMe drive is working significantly over time, um, that I'm not risking also. I mean, it should be fine, but, but I'm not going to be passing any more thermal load over to the motherboard. Now, pay, I need to pay attention with what screws I'm actually taking out of this thing. We put these back in. So I've been building computers since I was eight years old, and I de um, no one in my parent, uh, no one in my family was into computers at the time. And oh, eight years old might be too young, probably nine, ten. Um, but I remember electrocuting myself. I didn't appreciate how power supplies worked and I took apart my power supply because it was a broken PC and I left the power supply plugged in. Um, all I remember is just essentially waking up on the other side of the room. Um, I'm so lucky that I, I, don't, I don't know what was up with the electronic circuitry in my house at the time. Um, I tripped something, I don't know what happened, I was so young, I just remember blacking out and I'm just lucky that I didn't you know, grab around something and have my body get locked up. Okay, so focus, Chris. If I place the heat spreader on top, it looks like in this particular instance, I'm gonna be using dual purpose. Um, so this heat spreader, remove the plastic, um, is going to sit on top of the NVMe drive and the screw point on this, M on this NVMe heat sink is actually going into the same screw provision that the NVMe drive is going into. So it's gonna be securing both the heat sink and the hard drive into the motherboard on the contrary to this one over here whereby there was that extra provision further down. Okay, so there's that screws installed. One more screw to go, keeping it nice and firmly installed. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Okay, so we're now pretty much onto the point where we've installed the CPU, we've installed the RAM, we've installed the NVMe hard drives. Now we're at the point where we need to actually whip out the case and start installing the motherboard into the case. I'm trying to think if there is anything else that I've possibly missed. Graphics card can come later. I've got the power supply. Power supply, I'm using an old EVGA 850 watt that I used for mining last year. Let's see what we can fit on camera. Spare screws can be moved to the side. And also, I'm using an old case of mine. This is a fractal design case. Right, let's see if we can get some lights going on in here. Get 
Get some autofocus working for us. Are we getting enough visuals? Maybe I can move up a bit higher. Let's do that. That should make it better. Beautiful. That'll do. Now it's a little bit dusty in here. What I like to do, so if you're playing around with second hand components or just want to clean out your existing PC, I usually love using a leaf blower outside. Um, but leaf blower alone doesn't actually remove the dust that's accumulated and stuck to the surfaces. Um, so what I usually like to do is break it up a bit. I'm going around with a paintbrush. Uh, I like the fine brush, uh, sorry, like a fine hair brush. It seems to do a better job than the coarser brushes and uh, probably just because there's more more bristles to get into the finer spots all around the motherboard um, and then once I've you know broken it all up I'll use a leaf blower in here but uh, I won't do that for now that's okay there's not too much in here I've already given it a, a brief clean earlier so at this point in time the first thing we need to install is the IO panel so there's an I wow this particular motherboard comes with an embedded IO panel that's very interesting um, am I correct in saying that can't seem to easily remove it. But normally you have an IO panel that is separate, that comes separate in the motherboard and you install that on the back of your case and you cramp that in, or not cramp, you, you push it in until it clicks. Um, I'm just gonna see, be a little bit more careful than what I'm doing. I've put some cables sitting around the place. Just move my case band cables out of the way. It's getting mighty hot in here. Now I've actually laid the motherboard on top of the case fans. Alright, so very interesting this, this motherboard design to have the I.O. panel just sitting there stuck to the motherboard. So that's an easy enough install. Uh, let's just see, can we... I'm actually missing some mount points on the motherboard. So I'm not going to worry about them, but typically you'd have what's called, I believe, a, an offset, uh, which look sort of like this screw, uh, can I even see it on camera? Sort of like this screw where you'd, you'd install it onto the motherboard, you'd screw it, sorry, screw it onto the case and that would provide you support underneath your motherboard. This light is so strong and contrasty, um, but it will provide you essentially another screw point into the case. Uh, for me, I'm not gonna bother, I'm gonna keep making some progress with this video, oh, sorry, with this build. So see if I can quickly grab some case fans. And some case screws. I'm just going to turn on some fans as well because it is hot in here. Now, typically for installing the motherboard, there's usually anywhere between four and ten screws that you can install into the motherboard. And they typically come with the actual case itself. You very rarely, if ever, would have case fan, uh, sorry, case screws provided with your motherboard. So I'm just gonna be grabbing these screws here. Can it autofocus? So they pretty much have an installed, I can't even think what they're called now, oh my goodness. Washer, a pre-installed washer embedded into the screw itself. Okay, I actually really don't have very many offsets in this case. This is actually crazy. It's almost like I had a mini, mini motherboard previously used in this case. So I'm just gonna check this out. We've got <laughs> one offset, two offsets installed. That's actually insane. Okay, I actually have to quickly grab some offsets. Now that I'm doing it, I might as well get most of them installed for the so, for my motherboard, I've already visually laid this out. I know that I need to ha and screw in this offset. Sometimes you get a tool or you can just do it with your finger. Um, but I'm just going to hand screw in this offset as tight as I can. But yeah, normally you get a tool that you can you know, crank it. Which, let's see if I've got one here while I'm doing it with my hand. Yes, I do. So the tools that you can... Yeah, I don't know what they're called. Probably look up motherboard offset installer. 
it's essentially a Phillips hook, um, head on top and then a hexagon hexagon connector on the bottom which just sits right on top of each each one of them each one of your offsets that you're installing allowing you to just give it a few rotations whoop, with your screwdriver alternatively you could probably just get one of these what do you call, what do you call them like a hex head from like a typical screwdriver kit it's like the female version of a hex head So I hope you guys are all enjoying building some computers. If, you've ever, if you haven't had a chance to, I'd recommend doing it once in your life. It's not overly difficult. It's sort of like Lego. It's a, for a newcomer, it's anywhere between you know, one and four hours, depending on how much you're installing. Uh, is it just, are you just installing a standard fan? Are you installing water cooling? Take your time, follow a guide, minus tech tips, whatever. People will get you through the process. And it's pretty hard to do it you know, terribly wrong. They're very forgiving and have a lot of fail checks in them. Um, and you know, a lot of the cables are essentially pre-configured. Uh, it's, you know, cables man labeled CPU power. Ooh, getting a bit of allergies. Um, so you know you're gonna plug that cable into your CPU. You got your GPU labeled cables, plug it into your GPU. And also they're typically in most situations it's physically impossible to plug a cable into the wrong slot. The only ones which can get a little bit questionable is your CPU and GPU are typically both four pins. Um, GPUs are starting to change over to, a, I believe, a 12 pin design as of RTX 4000 series that's coming out. Um, and they started to trial that, I think, with a 3090 Ti. Man, why not? So shaky. Ooh, let's get this camera. What is this? What's this camera doing? It's starting to fall down. So we can tie that. Urgh. Slowly falling down as the video is progressing. Beautiful. Now as far as powering up the motherboard goes, now I don't actually have my power supply installed just yet. Uh, let's see where those cables are going. Oh beautiful. I've got spider webs in my PC, in my power supply bay down the bottom. Actually might need to quickly take this outside and give it a leaf blower for sure. This case has been probably sitting in my shed for two years. Now I was going to check something. Yeah, all good. It's tight. Take this outside. I'm lacking in here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> what? Okay. Let's get some of my parts out of the way. Clear the workbench. This is my rear panel. All the cables going through here, essentially going through these rubber flanges, grommets, allowing me to cable manage whatever cables we need. Now, the power supply that I'm going to be using is somewhere around here. I'm using a modular power supply, which means I can pick and choose which cables I desire to be installed in this case. So this is the EDGA Gold G2. And from what I can see on this motherboard, this motherboard actually requires two CPU cables. So I'm gonna personally plug, leave two CPU cables installed. And for my 3080, I'm going to need Undo these cables. Um, and we also need two GPU cables. 
So 3080s can typically draw anywhere between 300 and 400 watts from memory and one cable, I think it's like max rated to be about 300 watts. So if you used one cable, you're gonna actually melt your cable. Even if your cable has two GPU outlets, this is actually really important to know because your, your graphics card may take between two and three um, GPU cable inputs and people can be confused that so that means hey I've got one GPU cable which is splitting out into two GPU connectors I'll just use the one cable little do they know um, give it a few weeks months there's a slight chance depending on the thermal load the temperature of the day how much gaming they're doing they may actually melt that cable um, not typically a fire hazard I say not typically every time I've ever seen it happen especially with mining it just melts and produces a lovely smell but yeah you want to get that right so I also need a heap of SATA cables because I have 20 odd power supplies that I'm intending to connect, uh, sorry, hard drives. So I'm going to be using all of my SATA peripherals. These are the modular cables that I'm talking about. They're all just click and connect, um, play and play sort of slots. Uh, I've got my main motherboard, main motherboard cable connected, two CPU cables, and then I've got two GPU cables, um, which I need to connect and route all of these through. But yes, it's probably going to be a lot easier if I connect the side of cables now rather than later. Because once this power supply is sitting in there, it's actually quite difficult to add access to those modular components. Okay, I'm just trying to remember where have I stored all of my EVGA SATA connectors. You know, the things you don't get ready for the video. This took me too long to prepare for. I, this um, streaming gig is not my forte. Yet, anyway. Let's hope we can get it more streamlined for my daughter. I mean, that's the intent of this build. Trying to try and actually have a dedicated setup that she can go to, click record, and away she goes. Right now, she's been using her iPad, which is great. It's teaching her the fundamentals of recording and editing she's using adobe premiere rush but predicament with that is just the recording quality on the ipad is limited for her pokemon card unboxing and not to say that she can't do that it's just a matter of giving her some options and letting her creative juices flow with different cameras different angles different streaming setup becoming familiar with different ways to record um i'm not trying to push her down any particular path i just like to give her the options and the tools to see if she enjoys something and runs with it. At the moment, she absolutely loves art. And I figure, a bit of filming. Oh, she does Pokemon cards as well. Um, can't hurt to try and mix the two. See if I can get some snippers. I've got some old EVGA power supply cider cables. Now, it's really important that you actually use the same cables that come with your power supply with your power supply. Um, you shouldn't be using old cables from other power suppliers because each power supply vendor actually wires their cable. It can be the same sometimes, but there isn't a standard that ensures all power supply cable cables are identical. Um, so whilst they are the same on the connection side that goes into your motherboard, graphic card, CPU, hard drive, uh, it's not actually wired the same through to the power supply itself. So that actually means that you could actually trip, break your power supply or break some of your computer components if you've used the wrong cable. Because power is going through pin one out of the power supply and ends up at pin eight on the motherboard side for vendor A, whereas pin socket one on the power supply side for vendor B might actually go through to socket six or pin six in the motherboard or something. It just might not be mapped out one to one. I know that's definitely the case that they're not always mapped out one-to-one. -one. So you do need to be very, very careful with that and you can blow components. Now, I'm not entirely happy with the side of cables I've just chosen. I'm trying to think, do I run with it? Do I run with it? Do I run with it? They are three. Might just need to get some adapters in the future. Cool, anyway, this will do for now. So I'm gonna install these four SATA cables. They're gonna each give me three SATA connectors. Now I do have, a, have over 20 hard drives to connect at some point and I've 3D printed out some hard drive base so I'm going to stack all these hard drives um, but the problem being obviously is that I've got over 20 hard drives and I've only got 12 so three per cable um, 12 SATA power provisions I'm going to be very underwhelmed. Now I do need to look up some of the specs here because I believe each power, uh, hard drive can spin up to about 10 watts of usage 
um, per hard drive as they spin and typically these SATA cable provisions only allocate for about, sorry, they're only supposed to have a maximum load of 54 watts from memory so that would imply you know, five hard drives per cable is max so I could potentially get some SATA splitters um, and try and beef that out and I've got to have a bit of a think about what other options do I have. Um, it's 12 volt, I, oh, SATA's you started from memory, I thought it had 3 volt pins, 5 volt pins, 9 volt, 12 volt pins. I've got to look into what is actually used nowadays. Like is 3 volt redundant? Um, because if it is, then it might imply that, you know, if, if the only thing that's used nowadays by the SATA power connectors is the 12 volt, then potentially I could get some GPU cable converters because GPU cables are on the 12 volt rails. So I could convert from GPU cable over to SATA. Um, and I do have spare, and this is a like, there's plenty of power on this um, power supply, uh, being that it's 850. Uh, yeah, I just need to look into what my options are to get all these hard drives online. I mean, potentially I could just have a dedicated power supply sitting off to the side, which is being relay triggered, um, or just simply um, has a stopper on the end here, which has a jump. Essentially, you can get little motherboard connectors that go into, sorry can't find it, but motherboard power connector caps, and those caps have got a jumper pin in them, and those jumper pins essentially uh, send a command to the power supply to turn on. So you're jumping the power switch. So that is an option that I have. How are we going for time? 2 p.m., 50 minutes. Let's see if we can up the pace and rush through the rest of this build so I can get some progress done. Got some work. Get going. All right, so this particular case has some sort of enclosure system that caps over the end of the power supply and it keeps the power supply in place. So I'm not gonna get a good vision on this, unfortunately, but it stops the power supply from coming out. And then once I've got this cap installed, it also has four provisions for me to actually, so what I'm doing now is there's two thumb screws that connect this cap to the case. And then thereafter, there's four provisions for me to screw this cap into the power supply. So then that prevents the power supply from falling into the case. This shield stops it coming out initially, all ready to go. Just need to get myself four of the typical case fan screws. I mean, sorry, case screws, which look like ugh, these they're a larger hex looking head hex slash ugh, can it come up Phillips head come on Keo Pro Razor webcam do it for me that looks like it's not getting sufficient light to decide to autofocus onto that unfortunately yeah let's see if I can get it on this one instead does this one have auto well it's supposed to have autofocus Anyway, four of these case fan screws. I keep calling them case fan, they're case screws. Let's just see if we can shift this case into the vertical pause just for this screwing down piece. All right, one in. Now what I'm gonna do a little four volt drill from the brand Ryobi. Pretty cool. Low torque. Forward reverse. Can quickly bust these in. Xiaomi also has a thing called a pen, a wow stick, but I prefer this personally. This I can use for anything and everything. Really versatile, really rigid, uh, robust, good battery life. Okay. Let's move this. Let's move this. So this particular provision here is gonna land my motherboard cable right next to the motherboard socket that I need to plug it into so we can route that there. 
Uh, this is my SATA power cables for primarily and only, at least for my build, only for the hard drives. So I'll leave them to the side because I still need to have a think about what I'm going to do. This build's probably going to have an open side chassis. It's not going to have a closed case. So once I map the other critical components that are bound to the motherboard, bound to the inside of the case, once I get those cables routed, I'll consider what we can do with the SATA cables. Uh, so. Yeah, graphics card's also gonna be around this point, so I'm just gonna throw that cable through. Now, I have actually just installed what was on this power supply before, um, which is essentially GPU split cables. Ideally, I should've just installed the single versions because I'm gonna have spare cables now, or connectors sitting off the end of these GPU cables, but once again, this is not a pristine install, um, so I'm not gonna get overly particular about this. I just want to get this up and running functional. Now these CPU connectors, typically there's provisions on the top side of your case that allow you to get straight to the CPU and have as little much of your cable showing on the visible side of your case. Now this should be okay. This is very janky. Now these cables are very very resilient. You can squish them and move them around quite a fair bit. Now on the back of these cases is normally where you install your uh, SSD drives. But we're just going NVMEs today, so we don't have to worry about any of that. Uh, I've got some spare cables from the case fan. Case fan, the front case header typically uh, provides power, oh, sorry, USB and audio in most instances, and that's what you know, these cables are. So I've got these three that do have to now go somewhere. I'm trying to think what's the shortest distance to get these cables out of the case. Now I've got this hard drive base here that I'm never ever going to use. So I'm just going to quickly remove these hard drive bays just to get a little bit more space for my cables. And also just in case I can see an additional escape route for me to map these SATA cables. Ideally, I just want these SATA cables to exit the case in the shortest distance possible, which means I've got the most available cable to me for flexibility outside of the case. More cable outside of the case means I can place my hard drives anywhere, everywhere. Oh, that is interesting. So even though I've just removed that, I can't even get this thing out. Snap, and that's because I have to remove that to get it out. All right. I'm just gonna reinstall it. That's not gonna happen. I'm just going to reinstall the chassis and just leave it here. Okie dokie, I'm gonna just do what I can. I'm gonna map all these side of cables at this lowest point.
Alright, we're ready to turn this case over and see what we're left with on the other side now that we've ripped everything through. Cool. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. Oh, I made a mistake. So, I pulled through this power supply cable on this underside, but ideally it should have gone through this flange here, straight into the motherboard here, and you would have had the least amount of cable traffic. Instead, I'm doing a very horrendous cable pull through this bottom section only, um, which once again, it's a bit of an atrocity, but for the intent and purpose of this build being a very quick slap dash together, secondhand build, I'm not selling to anyone. It's just for our shed, for filming this in this webcam rig. Um, got some SATA connectors here that I could use, but I'm probably just gonna use the SATA cards that I've got that I'm going to be installing. So that should be okay. This is the USB header for the front of the case, which is a bit of a nightmare. Once again, I'd probably install it down this side instead next time for this particular motherboard, because this motherboard has the USB 3 header on the bottom side of the motherboard. So typically you map out where do your cables need to go and choose the path of least resistance and also the path that is the lowest amount of, oh, there's a PCI connector down here, that's crazy. What? PCIe power connector. Okay, that's beyond me, I've never seen that before. It's like providing additional power to the motherboard PCIe lines? Holy moly, I've got to research that. There's a PCIe power connector here. Okay, that's on my to-do list. Um, I've never seen that before. Fascinating. I'm trying to think what that would be doing. Like additional power to the power lanes if you're potentially using two graphics cards or something? Or a very thirsty PCIe card? Man, I'm gonna pull these cables through completely. Ooh, okay. This is so ugly. I am so, 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 so sorry. For anyone out there who gets triggered by ugly cable management, this is gonna be one of those ugly but functional cases. Okay, so here are my graphics card connectors. Do the graphics card last, because I don't have it physically on me at this present minutia. I'm trying to find where I'm actually mapping these um, cables to, to turn this case on. So normally you have a little pin strip which is mapped out and, dic and it has labels on the motherboard itself that says this is the two pins which will power on the motherboard, these are the two pins that will do resets on the motherboard. Um, in this instance, I've got nothing. Hmm. I'm actually going to need to get the motherboard manual out, that's not ideal. I'm pretty sure I threw away the motherboard as well. So in that instance, I need to, uh, sorry, the motherboard menu from ages ago. So I just have to go online, download. Download the manual. I'm trying to think if I want to do that right this minute. Let's just keep tidying up for the moment. This travesty. Okay, so these are my CPU. Connectors, case fan. I'm just gonna go ahead and install. This motherboard requires two CPU cables to go into the motherboard to provide sufficient CPU power. I'm going to install them and then push back the cables through to the rear side of the cable for cable management. Yeah, as if cable management's a thing for this. We've already discussed that this is not the prettiest install. A little bit fiddly trying to get this in there. 
So this particular, uh, the CPU cables that I'm trying to store from this power supply in the very least um, are coming split, so it has two four pins as opposed to a single eight pin. I believe that's due to legacy compatibility. Oh, I've just had a power outage. Holy moly. Okie dokie. There we go, check that out. Wow. What on earth happened there? What on earth? I have a Tesla battery set up. Why did that happen? This is crazy. So we have um, Tesla power walls. We're an off-grid setup here. Oh, mate. That is not good. My, mother, my laptop's just stayed online because it's obviously battery powered. So I have a Tesla power wall set up and it's off-grid entirely. So if we have any stability issues with our Tesla batteries. Um, it just powers down our whole house and our whole business and all my computers turn off. Now most of my computers are set up to be connected to an emergency street supply, most of my critical computers. So they haven't been affected, but everything else got powered down, which is really unfortunate. Um, It's a bit sad to still have these issues. So I've got 10 power walls that are set up and that was what was advertised from Tesla that they could do. And it typically works for them when people are connected to the street because the street is always a backup. So if your batteries have any issues for like a microsecond, then the street provides sufficient power to keep your power load consistent. In my instance, because I'm not connected to the street and I'm a complete off-grid solar battery setup, um, if there's any power discrepancies then everything just goes offline and reboots. There's we would have seen in the video. Um, so what has been advised from Tesla, they've been looking into this for the last year for me. Yeah, eight months now. Um, I have to turn off a couple of batteries to try and keep the system stable. There seems to be too much CPU overhead um, and bandwidth limitations on the brains and the controller that's looking after the whole 10 power wall battery array. But I had nine connected to today, today so it shows that nine doesn't work. So I've just turned off another battery, so now we're down to eight. And if it keeps happening, I'll go back down to seven. I've sort of been going up and down depending on power requirements because I have cryptocurrency mining here. But yeah, I'm gonna have to start winding that down because I just can't get enough batteries and power to keep going. You know, not, not having 10 batteries online is being a little bit challenging. Anyway, that's not a big deal. It's something I'm dealing with. Um, okay, so back to the build. Uh, yes, I've got the Four pin connectors, so split up, and eight pins connect, uh, split up into two four pin connectors, so I have to merge them together to connect to the motherboard's eight pin slot. And typically, most motherboards actually have eight pins for the CPU connectors. And in this instance, this motherboard has two eight pins. So 16 pins of power delivery requirement on the 12 volt rail from the, uh, from the power supply. And interestingly enough, each one of these cables can actually provision like from memory about 200 to 300 watts based on their rating of how thick the cable is. So it's very interesting that we need so much power. Um, I'm trying to think what, you know, I don't remember any 11th gem CPUs drawing over 300 watts, but obviously I don't really know. I haven't looked into the hardware architecture properly in such a long time. Ugh. Okay. Pretty much just want to install those CPU um, cables so the clamps, the little hook clamps, go over the hook provision and it means essentially that the cables won't just rip out as the, 
PCs being moved around. And to actually remove these cables, you have to compress the little hooks to, uh, you have to press a little mechanism to release the hook and allowing you to pull. Okay, so now I'm pretty much at the point that I need to connect the graphics card. Oh, do we have a spare case fan? System fan, let's plug that into the system fan slot. You can actually control your system fans through your BIOS controls, set their speeds. Okay, I'm just pulling these cables through completely. See if we can push back. I just need to install these cables here, which will allow me to turn the PC on, off, and have the LED lights show. I've also got the PCIe to SATA connectors that need to be installed. Oh, cards, I should say. Now, I've turned the aircon off because I don't want power to trip, or at least add any more thermal load. Thermal load, battery load. So installing these cards into the SATA bays, oh my goodness, into the PCI lanes, creating new SATA bays for my hard drives. It's gonna be very interesting to try and cable manage this exercise. Uh, I'm gonna be using the PCI lanes that are the furthest away from the graphics card just to ensure that I've got sufficient airflow for the graphics card. It is gonna be an open side case. I'm not gonna be putting the glass cover on essentially because I do need to get these SATA cables out and to power up these hard drives which are going to be sitting in 3D printed hard drive holders and they're mountable. What am I doing? I'm trying to get this in. Right, and these are just thumb screws. So I'm just going to place them first. I mean these don't need to be overly tight so I'll just get them thumb tight. In, in, in. Cool, I see no issues with what we've done here. Only predicament is hopefully this graphics card isn't too huge. Uh, I do also have these audio cable provisions. Where do they go? I'm almost not even going to bother. All right, I need to quickly go get my graphics card. Okay, this is an RTX 3080 that's been pulled out of a Dell XPS 8940 machine. A little tiny computer those are. It should have a much happier life, much cooler life in this install. Let's see if we can fit it within the PCIe lane. This is the PCIe Express 16X slot which has all the sufficient bandwidth for your graphics cards. Um, Now I'm just going to install some thumb screws. I do also have exposed rear slots that I'm not going to bother closing up for this install, but typically you would get PCIe slot covers for any of the slots that are left open. But my whole case is going to be open, so that's not necessarily paramount. Now these are the cables I was talking about before where your single PCIe power cable is split out into two, which can be quite deceptive um, for newcomers trying to plug one cable into the graphics card when the graphics card could actually draw more power than that single cable can provide. And you'll actually find that your cables can melt at this point or on the PCIe side, typically at the connectors and the plastic melts and gets bonded and can break your 
graphics card power supply point and someone would, you'd have to get a specialist to resolder on a new um, power delivery connector. Um, this is just going to have to do for now. Uh, maybe I'll just do a little grab a cable tie. Oh boy, just reinstalling my underside filter. There we go. All right, let's get this hot mess slightly less hot. I'm not using the best side cutters for the job. I usually prefer like a flat side cutter. With that non-flat side cutter, you're, you're left with some sharp, sharp nibs on your cable ties. Not ideal. Okay, so these are all out of the way. Now, the only thing I've just realized, which is not cool, not cool at all, is that I'm still left with these cables. And my hands are all dusty. Um, I look up the manual, find out where I'm supposed to be installing these, which header. And I'm going to have to magically try and cram them in. Look, I really only care about one of these connectors. Uh, and that is the hard drive switch, uh, power swipe, <laughs> hard drive switch, power switch, just to turn the motherboard on. I don't care about reset switch for, for this particular install. Um, I, can, I can fit it in, so be it. But essentially, it is optional. You can just simply turn on your PC via the power switch and be done with it. Now I'm going to quickly. Okay, let's see if we can quickly Google this motherboard manual. Z590 MSI carbon motherboard manual. Ooh, I actually still have the manual. I lied. So it's the JFP1 header point, and this is where it's indicating the pinout diagram. So for me, it's in a very awkward position because I've obviously done too much cabling. It's down the very bottom corner, which is a pretty common location to, for it to be located. And I'm just quickly reading the pinout orientation power switches on the top side top right hand corner side yeah, I've got enough space to get this in I might be lucky enough to get them all in actually so these are just essentially two females to jump these connectors so this is my hard drive LED and then I've got a power LED, so the front of the case should essentially just be light up whenever there's, pow whenever there's power to the case. And whenever there's hard drive activity, it will light up the hard drive. Let's see if we can get this reset switch in. I'd highly recommend always installing this towards the side of the build, unlike me. Who's now doing it at the very end and just did the reset switch wrong. So there's two pins that I need to connect to and I'm going to just put the reset switch on one of said pins. Can I get it in? Boy, that is difficult. 
Right, I'm gonna pull out the power switch first, just to give me a little bit of room to get the reset switch in first. I've essentially got eight pins that I'm trying to connect four cables onto right now. Two pins per cable, and I think we're pretty much done. Well, got my last and final cable to go in. Beautiful. Okay. Now we've got all the cables in. The last job is closing up the rear panel, but look, I probably won't close it until I test it, but I'll at least start pulling all the excess cables through and I can cable manage it on the rear side. Just gently tugging everything. Cause there's no need for it to, you have to have all this loose spare cable on the other side. Just getting a quick visual. How are we looking? Don't need this case audio cable to be used. We'll put that away. Got all this spare space down here. Cool. Anything floating? Are you kidding me? I just pulled out the reset switch and the hard drive switch. Crazy. I don't even know how I managed to pull it off. I was trying to grab a different cable and I did the wrong one. All right, beautiful. Now I'm just gonna do a power on test. See if I can get everything to spin up. I won't have this connected to a monitor just yet. Mm. Take that back, I do have a spare monitor. I'm just gonna bring it over. I've got these little Raspberry Pi monitors, which should do a beautiful job. So these cool little mini screens that I can plug into just via USB and HDMI cable. These are typically used for Raspberry Pi installs, but it can come in handy for some remote diagnosis when you don't have a monitor just sitting around everywhere. Readily at your disposal. Come on, feel the power button. Whew. Wasn't getting any power there for a second, that had me worried. So it looks like this is how far away we have to have the hard drives literally butted right up against the case. CPU or memory has changed. Cool. That's a good sign. So what I would typically do now is install a USB, grab an eight gigabyte USB, stick on a PC that you already have configured or a laptop. Hang on. What's going on? Um, you go to the Windows website, download a Windows 11 media install package, which allows you to install Windows 11 on a USB stick, plug it into the PC, and boot from that. Uh, memory modules were found on non-optimized memory slot. That is pretty fancy. Okay, in that instance it's saying I think it was trying to tell us to move to slots two and four rather than one and three. That's probably the default optimized ones. I just couldn't remember before. And so I'll, I'll, I'll switch that out shortly. Just letting it do some boot up diagnostics. Cool. 
Cool. I'm just going to turn this machine off and do as per its recommendations to move out of slots one and three over to two and four. That's pretty fancy for a motherboard to actually tell you that. Oh, wow. The PC already had Windows 10 installed. Winning. All right, we're good to go. We are good to go. Now it's all just about, I mean, I'm pretty sure I've got a, yeah, I've got this connected. Going to Windows R, typing in DX Diagnostics. It's gonna tell me it's recognizing the CPU, 32 gigabytes of RAM, isn't recognizing my NVIDIA drive because I haven't installed the NVIDIA drivers. So that's the next thing for me to do. Anyway, thank you for hanging around. Uh, yeah. Ask me questions anytime, happy to help out. See you in the next video, guys. Off to go edit this.